Hey guys! So today we are going to talk about the beginning of chapter eight. Um, I've got I've got chapter eight sectioned out into three sections, three PowerPoints. Um, but <clears throat> I'm going to go over PowerPoint one and two today. They're not that long. I don't remember why I sectioned it out that way. I think because it's just long and there's a lot of information. So next week we're going to go over um, m the third section of it. So um, we won't do it all today. I'm going to present my screen so you guys can see this. And you've already had a little bit of a, um, a start with um, the, the um, video from last week about the ante rooms and uh, clean room and all of that stuff. Uh, we should be going over that a little bit more in depth too. Okay, so this is part two. I want part one. Hold on. Okay. So I'm going to... Uh, let's see. Slideshow. Okay. So chapter eight, part one. Okay, so medication safety and quality assurance is a big thing in the pharmacy. Uh, medication safety... Uh, every pharmacy has, has set a standards and best practices to ensure safe medication delivery. And then quality assurance establishes a system for ensuring a quality product. So especially in a compounding pharmacy, you're going to want to make sure um, that you are following quality assurance procedures uh, guided by the standard operating procedures or the SOP. And that is a um, guide on um, all of those, you know, procedures to um, keep quality assurance. And then uh, there, it, quality assurance is actually monitored through audits and tests, uh, such as glove fingertip, glove fingertip monitoring, media fill tests, things like that. Um, usually they will have a person in your pharmacy, if you work at a compounding pharmacy, um, they'll have someone there who does quality assurance. They'll have, it'll either be a, a pharmacy, a pharmacist or a pharmacy tech, usually pharmacy tech, that's a senior pharmacy tech. Uh, and they kind of have been there for a while and they will do the quality assurance checks um, whenever um, and however, how many, however many times they need to do that and make sure a lot of times they have checklists and things like that to make sure that everything's getting done uh, and done in a timely manner because you really want to um, protect, you know, your patients and you uh, from getting like sued for uh, malpractice and things like that. And this is just helping to prevent errors, errors in the pharmacy. <laughs> okay. So medication errors are preventable events that can lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm while the medication is in control of the patient or healthcare professional and can happen at any time in the filling process. So reducing errors, how do we do that? Especially on our end, because I mean, we can't um, reduce errors necessarily always with the patient because sometimes they take the medication wrong or whatever, but we can reduce errors that we create in the pharmacy um, so automation is one. In the hospital setting, automation has decreased the frequency of medication errors. This includes uh, electronic counting devices and ADS machines like uh, Pyxis, Omnicell, and the MedSelect. So you guys, some of y'all have seen that, um, those ADS machines in the hospitals, and we've talked about that, um, that they house medication, and um, the nurse or whoever can come up and get that medication. It's usually the nurse of the patient. Um, and it's all done electronically and they can get the, the medication for the patient without having to go to the main pharmacy in the, uh, uh, in the hospital. Now automation, you also probably have some automation in your own pharmacy. Um, I think it's called the cell, um, at the Walgreens pharmacy counts medications, um, for you. So that can help because most of the time it's 100% accurate, right? So if you have a large dosage of medication, it can go in the cell. However, don't forget, the cell can never have sulfa drugs or antibiotics um, uh, such as penicillin. Um, in, I think it can do other ones, but it cannot do penicillin type of 
antibiotics because of the frequency of people being allergic. And as the medication goes down, it can cross-contaminate other medication and possibly make someone have a reaction. So um, you cannot put sulfa drugs or penicillin drugs in a um, automatic counting machine like the cell at Walgreens or um, any of these other ones um, that automatically dispense medication. Uh, the pharmacist verification reduces errors as well. And, you know, they always check after you uh, uh, fill something and they will uh, initial it as well. And then tech check tech reduces errors, but some states allow that. I don't think that this is often done uh, in very many states, and I don't think Texas allows it. Um, but it's basically where another ch technician can check the other technician's work. Um, but as far as I know, they do not have that yet in Texas. It has to be checked by a pharmacist. Um, so some other ways that the uh, module talks about is asking patients questions about their medication intake, allergies, conditions, counseling a patient um, according to Oprah 90. And remember, you as a pharmacy tech don't counsel the patient. The pharmacist counsels the patient. Um, but you can still ask them questions and be like, hmm, this patient I think might need some help. And so then you can get the pharmacist um, to help them um, and counsel them. The pharmacist can counsel them. Asking the pharmacist on duty questions if you're unsure. Select the medication from the hard copy of the prescription and not the printed label. Um, electronic notifications such as the DUR can help with reducing errors because if a patient comes in and... You put in that new medication that just got, but it con it has a contraindication with another medication, you can um, either talk to the patient, call the patient's doctor, that kind of thing, um, to or have the pharmacist call the doctor to make sure that that's something that they should be taking. Um, but you could also talk to the patient about like if there's, because they could just have medication in the um, system that they're not taking anymore too. So. Um, using verification methods to ensure the medications pulled matches the label. For example, checking and verifying NDC numbers. So hopefully you guys have had some experience with NDC numbers in the pharmacy. Um, checking expiration dates. So they should be checked and flagged once a month to prevent accidental dispensing of expired medication. That would be bad. Um, also remember that usually they will put the medication that's expiring soonest in the front and the newer bottles, the stock bottles that have just come in in the back. That way um, you're using the older medication and things aren't um, going to expire. Um, counting controlled substances at least twice. Don't forget that. So remember the uh, controlled substances two through five that are in the pharmacy, um, such as Vicodin, Oxycontin, um, you know, any of those uh, that are controlled need to be counted at least twice. Uh, verify patient's identity. Always ask for name and date of birth. That is one big one that they'll ask is, how do you um, verify a patient's identity? You're going to ask for their name and date of birth first. If they, for some reason, have two people in the system that have the exact same name, exact same date of birth, then you would ask their address because hopefully you wouldn't have someone with all three of those things the same. I don't know. Um, offer counseling per OBRA 90. Pharmacist must be the one to counsel. Always remember the rule, two patient identifiers. That's kind of the same thing up here. Um, verifying patient identify, uh, verifying patient's identity or a patient identifier is something that's going to identify the patient, right? So their name and date of birth, um, their address, and then their phone number. Um, use approved forms. Draw up long-acting insulin doses in the pharmacy in patient-specific syringes to prevent errors. I don't think you guys do that in the Walgreens pharmacy, but you might in a compounding pharmacy. Um, verifying medication before delivering to an ADM or ADS nursing unit. Use the barcode verification system. That is a test question that they wanted you to know. Um, and the barcode system is just basically where you are... Um, there's a there's a, uh, a barcode that goes into the ADS machine um, every time you are you as the pharmacy tech are delivering a medication there, so it matches up with the same um, with a barcode in the system. Uh, nursing units should be inspected each month 
each month to ensure safe medication storage. Make sure to check dates. Um, pharmacists should double check parent parenteral chemo meds um, orders prior to mixing. That's important. Pharmacy and pharm pharmacy and therapeutics committees at hospitals tailor the formularies for safe medication administration. And all this is in the module, guys. It's just like had a big list that you had to know of like ways to reduce errors. So I'm just basically going through what the module said. All patients' weights in hospitals should be in kilograms, not pounds. Uh, I didn't know that until I went through this and I was like, huh, that's interesting. Even in the U.S., um, annual written and skill demonstrations for pharmacy techs should be done to ensure skills are up to date. This is not a requirement by the state board, but a best practice for pharmacy. And then prior to dispensing warfarin or Coumadin, a patient's INR or a test to show how long it takes for your blood to clot needs to be checked to ensure proper coagulation. This was a test question. It was kind of a weird one. Um, that they wanted you to know that much in depth about this. But um, <clears throat> so it's not just warfarin, but there are other medications that are anticoagulant drugs. Um, one of them, oh, let's see, another anticoagulant. I can't remember. I added one on the list this year because um, there hadn't been very many besides warfarin or Coumadin. And, um, oh, it's, uh, no, that's warfarin and Coumadin. I don't know. I'll have to look and see. I can't remember which one it was, but because um, y'all haven't seen the list yet. Um, but warfarin or Coumadin is like the main one that is an antiplatelet, <clears throat> um, basically anticoagulation drug. Um, but the patient has to um, have an INR done, an INR test done pretty regularly to make sure that they are still clotting because it can be really dangerous if they're not clotting at all. You know what I mean? That can be like where they would bleed out if they cut themselves or something because their body literally has no clotting factor at all. Um, warfarin is needs to be closely monitored. So uh, patients um, can be monitored by their doctor, but also um, in the pharmacy, you can help with that and the pharmacist can help with that as well. Um, TPN is total parenteral nutrition and should use a barcode system to set up automated machines for nursing units. So basically TPN, I don't know if any of y'all have heard of this, um, but it's a method of feeding someone that bypasses the stomach um, or the gastrointestinal tract. And it's used when patients can't eat by mouth. And it's made up of amino acids, dextrose, water, electrolytes, and it's not a feeding tube. So it actually is a, um, it's an actual IV. And so you would make this a lot if you were in the pharmacy, um, the compounding pharmacy, because that's the only place that they make it. Uh, but one test question was about, oh, sorry guys, was about barcode verification systems. Um and how they need to use them with TPN. So that's one thing you should note. But I thought I would put in here what TPN is because I don't think they really like went through it very much in the module. Okay, so that was it for that one. I thought it was longer, so that's good. Okay, so now we're going to go to our Chapter 8, Part 2. Let's see, and we're going to go slideshow. Okay, so medication adherence. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Patient medication adherence is vital to medication safety. Um, one thing they wanted you to learn is how to do a day's supply of medication, which you should have gone over in Module 6, um, the math. But a day's supply equals number of tablets dispensed um, over the number of doses by the patient each day. It's pretty simple. So... You know, if you were dispensing 21 pills and they were taking three a day, it would be a seven-day supply, right? Pretty easy. Um, medication adherence, correct day's supply is vital to insurance and billing. Most insurance companies will only pay for 30 or 90-day supplies for one copay. A refill too soon alert may appear, which you may have seen at Walgreens, and different reasons for patients wanting more than what's prescribed. Sometimes they're taking it wrong or abusing the medications. Other times the doctor may have increased the dose but failed to write a new prescription. So there's a few different reasons. You know, I mean, I remember getting my wisdom teeth out and like I went through the pain medication really fast. 
Like it said to do it every four to six hours. And I was taking like every four hours, uh, like right at four hours. And so <clears throat> I went through it a little bit too soon. And they said, well, we can't give you a prescription until two days from now because um, your insurance won't pay for it. And I was like, well, I don't care about the insurance paying for it. I'll pay for it out of pocket because I'm in pain. So even my, and my doctor had written me a new prescription, but that was what the uh, uh, pharmacy had said. And same thing with like things like birth control pills. Um, you know, that's a one month, usually a one month uh, dose, but sometimes people will go at the end of the month and try to, but it's not completely the end of the month to try to get their refill just to have it on hand because it's convenient for them to go pick it up at a certain time. But then um, the pharmacy will say, well, we can't refill it until this sp specific date of the month. So um, that's why um, correct day supply is important. Uh, medication adherence. Underuse or overuse of medication can happen and both can be just as dangerous. Uh, a lot of times patients who underuse can't afford their medication um, or experience side effects they don't like. Um, they may have trouble remembering to take it um, or the doctor lowered the dose, but the prescription is still the same. So it just depends on, you know, what it is. But, um, you know, it's important to make sure that patients are taking them and taking them at the right time um, and, un and, and using their medications correctly. Um, so the PDC is the proportion of days covered. It's a percentage that represents the patient's adherence with a medication used by Medicare to calculate medication adherence and can impact reimbursement rates. Um, so, oh, sorry. So the, uh, that number is, or the PDC is the number of covered days divided by the number of days in the period times 100. Um, and then the MPR is the sum of days supply for all fills divided by the number of, of days in the period times 100. Okay, so prescription monitoring programs, aka PMPs, um, they're being developed and they are designed to give providers a database to research trends in controlled substance use. It flags patients who, who see multiple providers or request refills too soon. I would love to hear um, if you guys have this in your own pharmacies. Patients are identified for overusing controlled drugs, might be cash pay, go to different pharmacies each time, see multiple providers for the same medication, et cetera. So it's mainly to catch those people who are like going to all these different doctors and getting pain meds from all different doctors and then going to all different pharmacies. Um, I don't know if we have this in Texas. Like I said, I would love to hear y'all after going to the pharmacy for a while. Um, I would love to know if uh, this is a thing here in Texas. I haven't heard it is, if it is or if it's just like a – Thing that is coming up and coming. I don't know. Um, avoiding errors with rights of medication administration. So they go through this in the module that all of the, and it's just like a way to remember it is um, the rights of medication administration. So the right, the patient's taking the right medication, the right route, the right time, the right patient, the right dose, right, right, right documentation and right response. So all of these kind of mean something, um, to reduce errors um, in the pharmacy and with the patient. So right medication, um, safety checks in place to make sure the right medication is used and filled. Um, tall man lettering is a thing and look-alike, sound-alike drugs are a thing. So tall man lettering is for um, things like prednisone and pr prednisolone. So there are drugs that are almost exactly the same as far as their um, spelling, just like two letters off. And they are, they will have tall man lettering. And so if you Google it, but you've probably seen it in the pharmacy, maybe. Um, I'm not sure uh, if you've seen it yet, but it basically is this weird like font that they put in um, to make you recognize like, oh, this is that drug that looks like this other drug. So, um, you can see an example in table 8.2 in the module. I don't know what page that is exactly online. Um, all the pages numbers that you see in this are actually the physical book that we have at the school, but um, it's the same exact information on the modules. So, And then lookalike, soundalike drugs, um, they have a list for uh, that the Institute for Safe Medication Practices has put up. 
And um, they just have like a bunch of medications that are on the list that look alike and sound alike. So you have to be very careful about those. Um, the route, right route, so the route of, of administration should match the dosage form. For example, suppositories are only used rectally or vaginally. Watch out for error-prone abbreviations. Uh, the, the Joint Commission publishes a list for organizations it accredits. ISMP also publishes a more comprehensive list. Okay, and so here's a picture. This is from the book, actually, but this is also in the module. Um, you need to know these. These are error-prone abbreviations. So as you can see, there are some that, they, that are used, but it's just like they're close to another one or they look similar, that kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's one you need to know. These are ones you need to know. QOD and QID are ones that um, – and QD are ones they talk about a lot. So QD daily or QID four times a day. Um, is the misinterpretation of QOD. Okay, right time. Some medication dosages should be given at a specific time. For example, Ambien or Zolpidem, um, it's a sleep drug for insomnia. It should be given at night, clearly, because why would you take that during the day, right? <laughs> but I don't know who would think like, oh, I'm going to take this during the day and it'll work at night, but I don't know. Maybe some people think that. Ooh. Speaking of sleepy, this is like after lunch sleepy here. Okay, the right patient. Barcode technology helps ensure the right patient receives the right medication, especially in the pharmacy. And then don't forget, I mean, especially in the, the hospital. And don't forget two patient identifiers. You always have to use two patient identifiers, never just their name, um, never just their date of birth. You need to know both their name and date of birth. Okay, the right dose is the right amount of medication given to the patient. Um, high alert drugs or high risk medications require extra verification. ISMP publishes a list of high alert medications. High alert medications you need to be familiar with. Um, they talk about it in the module. The right documentation, vital part of the patient record. Electronic records are most common. Documentation is also used for auditing and billing. Um, right response, medication that have potential for risk for adverse reactions or black box warning labels will have a medication guide. These are, or a med guide, sometimes they're called that, um, but they're, it's short for medication guide. These are paper handouts that address specific issues with medications or medication classes. Some have REMS programs, such as Accutane, and it's called iPledge program. Um, this was actually a test question. Um, REMS, I don't know if we're going to go through that more in depth here, but REMS programs are basically programs for um, patients who, or, or medications, I think we've talked about this before, medications that are, have serious side effects or serious risks while taking, however, the benefit of them still outweighs the risk. Things like chemotherapy. Chemotherapy has a ton of risks associated with it, including death. You know, they've gotten pretty good at it, but the side effects can be extremely um, volatile for the patient. And so they do have REMS programs, like the patients have to be counseled before they're given this medication. The same with isotrintoin or um, REM, or uh, the Accutane. If you see right here on this list, isotrintoin is the third one here. And um, because of the risk of birth defects, isotrintoin is the generic of Accutane. That's usually the one that they'll ask you about. And it's really important because um, if you get pregnant while taking this medication, your baby can come out with sh extreme side effects like, you know, without an arm or something like that. Like that's how bad it is. So they, it's, it's actually for um, cystic acne and it works really well, but they do make you, if you're a female, they make you, um, I think, have a counseling session with um, – the doctor before they give you the prescription and it might be the, the the pharmacist might actually have to give you a counseling session as well and basically talk to you about um, the birth control methods they will basically make you take a certain birth control to, and sign a thing saying you're going to use two forms of birth control while on this um, and all of that so it's it's really serious you do need to know these medications um, another one that they'll ask about is NSAIDs 
is a risk of GI bleeding. And another one they've asked about is SSRIs. That's um, you're going to go through these a little bit more in depth um, here soon. But SSRIs are a type of uh, antidepressant, and it has an increased risk of suicidal thoughts in adolescents specifically. So um, all of these patients that take these need to be counseled about their medications. Okay, and that is it. I really thought that was going to go longer, but I kind of barreled through. Sorry, guys. Um, I hope that was uh, not too much information too soon. But hopefully this helps you as you're going through Module 8. Um, and next week we will go over the very end of it. Okay, um, let me stop presenting here. All right, guys, uh, I hope that was informative for you, and I will talk to you later. Bye.